thanks for coming out this morning and uh, getting into the talk. There's about 27 slides, so maybe around 30 for 30 minutes, I anticipate, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. So the title is uh, Processing Iron Oxide, Copper, Gold, Uranium, Ore. So it's a bit, bit long-winded with uh, all those uh, elements in there. So the abbreviation or acronym is uh, IOCGU for, for this presentation. This type of ore is, uh, is a general classification of ore, and there's a wide range of what that can be. Um, it's found throughout the world. Uh, there's even some, some in Queensland, uh, but there's especially a large amount uh, in, in South Australia. So the outline of the presentation begins with a bit of an introduction to this Australian Research Council uh, research hub uh, on the topic, and, and specifically uh, in more detail, the UQ node. Um, I'll then talk about the ore uh, composition a little bit and the radionuclide association. So uh, the radionuclide association has a big implication for processing. In some cases it can limit uh, the ability to transport the material overseas and, and only certain smelters are set up to uh, handle this, this type of uh, concentrates that are derived from this ore. IOCGU uh, copper flotation, I'll cover it briefly. Uh, I'll give a quick description of, of BHP Olympic Dam, which is one of the largest uh, uh, metallurgical facilities in the world, and it's, and it's processing the ore, including flotation, hydrometallurgy, and, and a, big, a big smell for that. Um, then I'll go into a little bit more detail about hydrometallurgy options to separate radium nucleides from copper concentrates. Um, Firstly, it, I'll talk about the high temperature non-ox or metathesis process, and then I'll discuss uh, uh, some preliminary results, I guess, about low temperature uh, separations. So the research hub was set up about four years ago, and it's a five-year project. Uh, major sponsors, BHP, also Oz Minerals, um, the ARC, the, the Department of State Development from South Australia, and uh, the Department of uh, Defense. The research partners are University of Adelaide, and the hub is based at University of Adelaide, Monash, Linders, and, and University of Queensland. So the aims of the, of the hub are to find new ways to remove non-target metals from copper concentrates, which should be able to form a substantial portion of the global pool of smelter feed. So this is a major potential source of copper. Uh, currently and, and in the future. Um, ensure that the methods are scalable, cost effective, and robust for actual uh, industrial application. And uh, a third point about leveraging emerging developments in highly sensitive radiation sensor technology um, by transferring existing technologies into the mining and mining services sectors. So this is a schematic of the hub. There's lots of some of the leaders of the nodes are up here. Um, Kathy from, uh, from BHP in the middle is, is a major supporter and uh, she presented late last year about uh, uh, Olympic Dam and, uh, and Brett from Oz Minerals. Um, the director of the hub is, is Stephen Grano and, uh, and Ruth is the, is the manager up there in the middle. So the node one uh, is, is based at, at Monash and with Ann um, and that's about radium clad fundamentals, and it's a lot of, um, I guess, geochemistry, I would say. Uh, node 2 is based at University of Adelaide, and that's about the sensor development and technology transfer. And then Node 3 uh, is, is here at UQ, and uh, that's about processing, uh, and we've been focused on, on physical separations and the hydrometallurgical separations. So the Node 3, uh, the UQ team, uh, is depicted here. Uh, so Peter's uh, the leader here at UQ. Um, Stephen Grano is an ex-UQ graduate, is the, is the director of the hub. Uh, myself and William Hawker, the chief investigators in the hydrometallurgy team. And, uh, and the other, everyone's here, Kelly, Wang, Stefan, and Efrain. Kelly uh, is finishing up her MPhil on the high temperature uh, metathesis uh, process, and, and I'll present some of her results today. Wang's been focusing his efforts on low temperature separations. Efrain's just started up. He's come over from Chile, and, uh, and he's working on developing a diagnostic leaching procedure um, to quantify where 
the radionuclides are in different classes of minerals. And uh, Stefan has been uh, contributing uh, as, as research assistant. Um, also based here at JK are Young Jin Pang, uh, Chris Bogowski, and Toby Hamilton. Um, and they're on the mineral processing side. So just about the ore, and just uh, uh, not, not meant to be an extensive list here, but some, some of the minerals and some of the classification of the types of minerals that are in IOCG ore. So we have copper sulfides, other sulfides, uranium and thorium minerals, so-called rock forming minerals, rare earth element containing minerals, and lead minerals. So that's a, a high level classic, classification with some specific um, mineral phases cited there. And then uh, below are some examples of where uh, the radionuclides uh, or how, they, how they're incorporated into these different classes. Um, it's, again, it's not extensive, but it's uh, some, some of the potentially more important um, associations. So there's uranium mineral inclusions is, is quite, quite uh, substantial. And then there's incorporation of radio, radioactive bismuth. The daughter elements of uranium and, and they, they, they can move around throughout the different um, mineral, mineral classifications. Inclusion, absorption, substitution throughout, and um, inclusion of radioactive lead into non radioactive lead minerals as well. So here's some examples of cross sections. Uh, backscattered electron cross sections of certain mineral grains, just to give you a feeling for some of the things that, that can happen. This is a calcopyrite grain, mostly, and here's a little bit of uh, hematite included, and then within the hematite is uh, some small uh, sub, sub six micron um, particles of, of uranium embedded into the, into the hematite, which is in the calcopyrite. So, this type of uranium would be a little bit challenging to separate uh, using physical processes. Uh, on the right, we have Gianna's gang here, so that's a mostly silica uh, with a uranium oxide phase, uh, and then embedded into the uranium oxide phase is uh, is, um, is some uh, chocolate, uh, yeah, chocolate site, double A. So the grain structure can be quite fine and, and intermingled, which can limit um, the efficiency of some of the, the physical separations. So this is a slide, just a, a little bit of background about uranium, and, and, and it's just a uranium radioactive decay series. So up here on the top left is uranium uh, 238, and it uh, decays um, through this series, different different elements and isotopes um, through thorium, radium, radon gas, polonium, lead 210, polonium 210, and eventually uh, to stable uh, lead 206. So when we look at the radionuclide distribution in the different phases, we put, we tend to focus on uh, uranium 238. Thorium 230, radium 226, lead 210, and polonium 10, because they provide the most substantial co contribution uh, to the overall radioactivity of the samples. So here's a table of, of IOCG ore in, in an example in the, in the uh, first row. Um, and then what happens when you uh, grind it up and send it through a rougher concentrate? can recover 96% of the copper and get upgrade 10 times from 1.6 to 16% copper. And uh, the RN distribution uh, doesn't change too much, but if you notice the lead, lead and polonium 210 actually uh, uh, preferentially um, deported to the, to the copper mineral phases that were floated. Um, and then in a final concentrate step, Copper recovery dropped off a bit. The grade went up substantially, and uh, uranium, uh, the radionuclides were, were cut back a little bit. But especially the uranium, thorium, and radium, um, but the lead and the polonium weren't, weren't cut back quite as much. And then, if, uh, in, a, in a second, uh, with the second sample, there was a regrind done, to, uh, 25 microns, and uh, 
uh, and in this case, the uranium, thorium, and radium were, were, were cut back quite substantially by doing that regrind. Um, but if you look at the lead and the polonium, um, it's kind of remained high. So this is the mineralogy of an example of an IOCGU uh, flotation concentrate using um, a quantitative X-ray diffraction. And in this case, we see that the major phases are calcopyrite and boronite. Um, the other copper-bearing phases, digenite, cobalite. Um, iron phases, hematite. The iron oxide is still there even, even after flotation. Pyrite. And the other gang minerals still present, quartz and other silicates and, and fluoride minerals uh, present in, in still substantial amounts. Uh, from the assay, this is still about 1.2 kilos per ton uranium, 0.3 kilos per ton lead, and most of that lead is non-radioactive, lead 206. Here's some photographs of BHP Olympic Dam in South Australia. So this is a major IOCGU deposit, which has been processed for quite a while now, and it still has quite a long future ahead of it. So there's both underground and open pit mining, uh, and the process is quite extensive. I'll go into detail, but it's minerals processing. Copper is produced through both pyrometallurgical and hydrometallurgical routes. And four products are actually produced, because there's a uranium oxide product and gold, gold and silver products as well. So this is a simplified flow sheet of the, of the first section of, of the Olympic Dam process. So the ore is mined and stockpiled ground down for flotation. There's a flotation concentrate from this process goes to what's called a concentrate leach step. In, it, it's important here to uh, separate the fluorides actually as a, as, a main, as a main objective and then and some of the uranium and thorium are, are separated in this leach step uh, and then the, uh, the dry concentrate uh, proceeds to smelting on site. Um, Copper was eventually recovered after electro refining, and the gold and silver are recovered uh, from the slimes during copper electro refining. The tails from the flotation process are actually further processed through a tails leach process. The concentrate leach and the tails leach are integrated with the solutions uh, going around, um, and it's a <coughs> sulfuric acid solution. Uh, which, uh, which is produced uh, at the smelter. Uh, the tails leach, uh, uranium and, and copper are solubilized, uh, and they proceed to solution purification through two stages of solvent extraction. The first is cation exchange to recover the copper, and then that copper is um, turned into copper metal by electroweighting. And then uranium is recovered by anion exchange solvent extraction. Um, it's stripped from the organic precipitated and then calcined to uranium oxide product. Okay, the, uh, the residue from the tails leach uh, is size classified. Some of it is incorporated into a backfill for the mine and some of it is stored in, in tailings form. Okay, so from an older BHP uh, report, They've cited some of the RN profiles in, in, these, in these streams uh, related to the process I just described. So the flotation feed um, may have uh, around seven or eight. Becquerel's per gram is, is, the, uh, is the unit of radioactivity. Um, so seven or eight coming into flotation, but in the flotation concentrate, the radio, the radio uh, activity of the concentrate is actually significantly higher than the feed. Um, now we're up to 24 to 30 here. Um, and the flotation tails look very similar to the flotation feed in this case. And then um, after the concentrate leach, the concentrate leach discharge actually is pretty effective at solubilizing uranium and thorium, um, but it's not effective uh, at solubilizing radium, lead, or chromium. So, uh, physical processing uh, can separate uranium and thorium to, to a reasonable degree, um, but if you want to bring the radionuclides down for 
for certain types of uh, uh, bio CPUs, um, you, you need to consider some hydromet options. So one hydromet option that's been proposed is called the non-ox process or high temperature copper metathesis. Um, metathesis is essentially, in this case for copper, is where you have copper in solution and you have uh, a non-copper sulfide solid and the copper in solution precipitates as a sulfide displaces the metal um, such as iron, nickel, uh, or lead and, and those uh, go into the solution phase. So it's a, a displacement reaction. Um, this type of process has been used previously for uh, separating copper from nickel uh, in, related to nickel smelting processes in South Africa. And so it's, it is conventional technology in that sense, um, but it has yet to be applied for, um, for treating copper concentrates. So there's a recent uh, patent where they're using mixed sulfate chloride solutions at about 200 degrees, um, and they showed uh, in, this, in this conference paper how lead, uh, uh, lead in the solid phase was decreased from 260 to 30. 30 ppm, and then in the related patent, um, there was another example at 185 degrees with this starting solution, 77 grams per liter copper in solution. And uh, in this patent, they showed how polonium 210 and lead 210 were reduced from 7 uh, to 1 mega over gram. So, this is a simplified flow sheet of the process. You take your copper concentrate, you send it to this upgrade autoclave at, say, 200 degrees. And you introduce a very concentrated copper sulfate solution into the autoclave. The metathesis reaction takes place. You separate the solids from the liquids, and you have um, you end up with uh, an upgraded copper concentrate. There's a split there. Some of that is recycled to a second autoclave process in this case because it's expensive to purchase all this copper sulfate. So you generate the copper sulfate from the from the copper concentrate itself. So it's, so it's two, two autoclave processes and they're integrated. Um, there's actually quite a bit of energy required in this process for heating that, that type of slurry up to 200 degrees Celsius. Uh, and also chlorides are required, uh, which can um, make for more expensive materials for construction, for example. Uh, so why are, why are the chlorides required? Um, I'll explain that with this uh, chemical thermodynamic diagrams. This is the solubility of lead sulfate as a function of uh, the activity of the sulfate and also as a function of the activity of the chloride. Um, so we can see here if there's no sulfate in solution, uh, lead can actually be uh, lead sulfate can actually be reasonably soluble. Um, of course, sulfate comes into solution as lead sulfate dissolves, for example. But, um, and then with increasing sulfate in solution, the solubility is, is decreased because lead sulfate solid is, is very stable. To counteract this, uh, you can add chlorides to the solution. And if here we can see that uh, the solubility increases as a function of chloride concentration, and that's due to the formation of a lead uh, chlor uh, aqueous chloral complex. Okay, similarly, uh, for polonium, um, this is some chemical thermodynamic diagrams. This is potential pH diagrams uh, for polonium chloride sulfate water systems. Uh, the red lines here show uh, the stability regions for polonium. And in the background on the left is, uh, is the, the solid phases for, for, for lead. Uh, and this is an example for flotation process. Um, Highlighted in green here is, is approximately uh, where uh, the potential pH of, of, of the flotation process. And uh, you can see that the flotation process is occurring where uh, you know, it's not oxidizing enough, so the, the polonium may be stable in, in this solid and elemental form. Uh, but with oxidation, uh, it can dissolve polonium into solution as a polonium chloride. In this case, it's pretty, pretty low chloride and lower, low sulfate in solution. On the right is more of a, an acid leaching scenario uh, where we have elevated chloride and elevated sulfate. Uh, and you can see that now we can potentially form uh, a 
cloning trichloride anion species. Uh, that decreases the potential, the oxidizing, oxidizing potential required to solubilize the elemental polonium. Um, and in this case, it's, it's strong acid, so we're maybe operating over here at about pH 0.5. Um, so as long as you can oxidize it sufficiently, then polonium could be soluble in those types of solutions. Okay, so that's a little bit of chemical thermodynamic background, but now we'll switch over to some of the results of the experimental studies um, that were done here. So this is for a, this high temperature metathesis experiment, so the batch experiments, the batch autoclave experiments, where we put in a copper concentrate, we put in an acidic solution. Um, we started off by deaerating with nitrogen to exclude any external oxidation. Uh, we run the autoclave at set temperature, for set time. Baseline conditions are 200 degrees for one hour. Uh, and then we, uh, after that reaction is done, we separate the solids and the liquids using vacuum filtration. And uh, wash, uh, we wash the concentrate. And we get a so-called clean copper concentrate. And we get a, a wash solution and a filtrate from the, from the first filtration. And we're doing this in a titanium autoclave, which is resistant to chlorides to some extent. Um, we, we have a glass line, it's a two liter autoclave. The mixing intensity is re reasonably high. Um, yeah, the temperature could go up to 280. We have the capability for sampling hot, and we also have the capability for in situ electrochemical measurements. So this is a, this is a silver silver chloride reference electrode, uh, which, which can be uh, inserted into the slurry during the reaction so we can monitor uh, the EH essentially. Uh, the autoclave has internal cooling and uh, we can potentially inject gases if needed. So this is uh, the result from that type of experiment. This slide's a little bit busy so I'll take a second to just uh, go through it. On the left y-axis we have the activity of the different uh, radionuclides in decals per gram. Uh, and on the y-axis we have the different solids. So this is the feed concentrate. This is the residue after metathesis uh, exposed to 30 grams per liter chloride solution. The residue after metathesis exposed to 75 grams per liter, 90 grams per liter, and 120 grams per liter. So this is essentially the effect of chloride on, um, on separation of radionuclides uh, during uh, high temperature copper metathesis. So you can see that the initial RN load is around uh, 12, 12 to 15 becquerel per gram per radionuclide. And then uh, we do the metathesis. The thorium and uh, uranium and thorium drop right down uh, at essentially all conditions. Uh, the radium didn't change very much. The lead was significantly reduced. and polonium was reduced a little bit. But the, this is the polonium here, and polonium uh, decreases as a function of increased chloride, uh, and so does lead. Uh, okay, but radium is, is, is relatively unaffected by chlorides yeah, for, for this scenario. Also on this graph, we have these uh, orange circles and blue triangles. The orange circle represents the copper precipitated and blue triangle represents the iron dissolved. So high numbers for both imply uh, a high extent of reaction for the metathesis reaction itself. So in this case, um, which separating radionuclides is one factor, but upgrading the concentrate uh, is another factor. Um, so, so you can see that copper, there, there seemed to be an optimal chloride concentration where copper was uh, precipitated from solution, and that's, and that's the objective here. And then iron seemed to be slightly more dissolved as a function of chlorides. And down below we just have a summary of the, this is the grade of copper, so it started off at 37% copper, which is already probably pretty high, uh, and then we upgraded it to between uh, 53 and 56% copper uh, using this, this uh, metathesis step. Should have started with this, but the feed solution going in with 77 grams per liter of copper, 30 grams per liter hydrochloric acid, and 
the chlorides were talked up here by adding sodium chloride, 4.7 grams per liter ferric, and uh, one hour and 200 degrees. And these baseline conditions were selected uh, to be somewhat similar to an example in the pattern. So that's the effect of chlorides on high temperature metathesis. And the second result from this study is the effect of the operating conditions. So um, you know, one, one hour residence time is long. That means a big, uh, quite a big autoclave. So if the residence time can be shorter, you get a smaller autoclave. If the temperature can be uh, lower, then that's a lot of energy savings. Um, so this is just a couple of tests where we looked at the baseline conditions, 200 degrees, one hour, 200 degrees, 30 minutes, 160 degrees, one hour. So what's the message here is that uh, it looked like 30, 30 minutes or one hour was actually didn't change the radionuclide profile too much. That's all that's close to experimental error. So there's suggesting we can go to a shorter time and still get uh, the same type of radionuclide separation. At 200 degrees, uh, at 160 degrees, it looks like there's a little bit more lead uh, remaining and, and a little bit more thorium. Um, but if you look at the the extent of the metathesis reaction for the iron copper exchange, uh, it dropped down a little bit with the shorter residence time, but it dropped down an awful lot uh, as soon as you went down to 160 degrees Celsius. So it seems like it's for this process, it's pretty important to to actually achieve those those higher temperatures in the process uh, if you want to drive the reaction that way. Okay, so a bit of a summary about high temperature metathesis from, from our studies. Um, uh, and I didn't show these results, but boronite and palpopyrite disappear and basic copper chlorides appear in the study. So we did uh, some chloride uh, in our final residues. Um, greater than 90% of the uranium and thorium are separated quite easily at uh, almost all conditions. Increasing chlorides promotes lead and polonium extraction. And the higher temperature is slightly better for iron separation. Higher temperature is much better for the metathesis reaction extent overall. And radium was not leached effectively in any of the conditions tested. OK, so that was high temperature. So just cooling down now a little bit to uh, 90 degrees. This is. Um, an example of copper metathesis reaction occurring at 90 degrees in 150 grams per liter sulfuric acid uh, for six hours. It's a cross-section optical micrograph, which just seems to be pretty handy for actually resolving the different copper mineral phases. Um, and just to point out that even at six hours here at 90 degrees, we, we see a lot of boronite um, being converted to chalcocyte and colloid. So the metathesis proceeds at at low temperature and the uh, room temperature is, is much more slowly and, and maybe much more mineral specific. So here's another table showing the result of a 90 degree sulfuric acid leach of, of a flotation concentrate in 150 grams per liter, this time for 24 hours, a little bit longer. We're aiming to dissolve a lot of the gang, gang minerals in this case. Um, so the initial flotation concentrate was 41% copper, 24% iron. So under these conditions, we could knock the iron uh, down in, in about, about half. We leached about 8% of the copper here, um, um, but the grade, the grade still went up uh, to 50%. The initial RNs coming in were around yeah, 13 to 18 peco per gram. And the sulfuric acid leach, even at 90 degrees, was pretty effective. At, separating uranium and thorium, but not, uh, not lead, not radium, not polonium. We took a look at the size-by-size -size distribution of, uh, of, of the, the leach residue at these conditions. Um, I'm not sure if it's exactly the same sample that was shown in the previous table, but this is, this is an example of how uh, the radionuclides are distributed on the different size fractions, and it's very clear that um, that they they are going on surfaces. And, and the 2.5 micron the smallest size fraction here has a has a very high uh, RN load compared to the uh, compared to the average. Um, 
here and see it. So as a bit of a, a summary of what's happening in this kind of leech step, which is, is similar but not the same as, as, the, as the Olympic Dam concentration, concentrate leach. We have these, uh, these minerals which are probably um, associated in terms of being part of, a, a part of the same particles. Calcopyrite boronite, this is an example where we may have hematite, we may have uranium included in hematite. I think this is a significant uh, uh, contributor here. Um, if, you, if you contact it for 24 hours at 90 degrees of sulfuric acid, you can uh, leach most of the hematite and, and uranium out. So uranium, thorium as well, iron going into solution um, with most of the calcopyrite, uh, boronite uh, in place if, if, you, if you don't add any oxidant. And then we get the, the other radiating clouds probably getting redistributed here um, on, onto surfaces of those particles. And then here's some, um, some advanced characterization of some of this uh, these particles coming out of a concentrate leach uh, step. And here we see a back backscattered image of, of the particle, and then the same part particle uh, uh, characterized using what's called the nanosames in Western Australia, and that's a secondary ion mass spectrometer. And compared to EDS measurements, this can provide um, uh, some resolution of, of very low concentrations of, of elements. And um, one of the interesting things is it, it, the detector can actually be specific to 210 elements. In this case, we've, most of the 210s uh, were lead. And, uh, and so we can see red is the iron, uh, blue is the copper, it's the copper, copper minerals. Um, even calcopyrite looks red in the way it's calibrated here. Um, but um, lead is, is green, and you can see that uh, the lead's actually the lead, and this is lead 210, is actually very uh, concentrated on the grain boundaries and, and on the surfaces. Uh, maybe not shown in this, this particular image. Um, so this is some direct evidence of the location of, of these radionuclides. We're actually, they're sitting in, in the PPD level. Uh, so we think that this lead 210 here might be, in the sample, it's maybe on the order of, of less than five PPD. The detection limits are not, this is kind of a, emerging characterization um, techniques, and so hopefully there'll, there'll be some information coming out about that. But, um, but it's very interesting to be able to resolve where, where the RN elements are, even though they're at, they're at the PPD level. Okay, so for, because of the challenges with high temperature metathesis, and it seemed to be the opportunity uh, uh, to separate, the, the desire to separate at lower, lower temperature, get these away from the copper concentrates. We're working towards a multi-step but low intensity uh, separations to remove the rate radionuclides. So I just I showed you already this sulfuric acid leach step where we can knock uh, the uranium and thorium down. Um, and we have second and third stages, an example of the second and third stage here. In the second stage, we can actually knock the radium and lead down a little bit of the polonium and we have a third step where we're trying to target polonium and we can get that done a fair way. Um, one, is, one is the objective, so, the, so we've, got, we've got one for three out of five elements here after this, this process um, and, and we're still, still working uh, this year on, on trying to get these numbers down uh, to get ones across the board. Um, at the same time, we're trying to, we're trying to minimize uh, minimize the copper leach as, as a general rule of thumb. Uh, and in this case, after the three steps, we still do have 22% of the copper solubilized. So these are some preliminary results, and uh, we're hoping to um, share more details about that uh, by, the end, by the end of the year. So summary and conclusions. Flotation and regrinding is, is, is quite effective and, and would be very cost effective compared to hydromet processing and rejecting your <coughs> However, for some ores, the iron load in the concentrate uh, remains high. Um, high temperature metathesis can upgrade copper concentrates, which is, which is a, an, an incentive in itself, and separate uh, residual RNs. Um, this process is, is a bit costly uh, in terms of 
capex for this multiple autoclaves and, and the heat energy. Uh, so we're focusing on low temperature options uh, for these RN separations and we think there is um, the possibility of this because of the, the fact that a lot of the radionuclides have been remobilized and are on surfaces, which is good for hydrometallurgy. Um, the new process should be simple, low cost, and producing copper concentrate with less than one Beco per gram RNs. Also, try not to dissolve too much copper because the copper smelting route is a little inherently more efficient uh, energy wise. And uh, we're also trying to minimize uh, chlorides uh, as well, or that requires additional washing. So that's the end of my presentation, but yeah, keen to have, uh, have questions and discussion about this topic. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>